everyone, welcome to the Katie Helper Show. So excited to be here. And you know what? If it's a Wednesday at 7 p.m., you can always hear the Katie Helper Show on WBAI, which is 99.5 FM or WBAI.org. And I'm always joined by my Gabe Pacheco. That's right. Uh, Gabe Pacheco here in the house. And on today's show, we're really excited that we are having the opportunity to talk to Norman Solomon, a journalist. He's the founder of RootsAction.org, and he is one of the co-authors of a report which is called Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis. And, of course, we're really excited to talk to him because of all this mishigas with Donna Brazil. To hear the rest of our interview with Norman Solomon, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you can hear our extended interviews. You can hear bonus content. I haven't seen you in a while, Gabe. Thrilled to be here, Katie. Thrilled to have you. And Gabe Pacheco, very funny stand-up comedian. You can catch him every Wednesday night. You can catch me at uh, Funhouse Comedy at Pete's Candy Store. And the show is in Williamsburg. And it is always at 10 p.m. And it's always free. And uh, yesterday, you could have caught me in the voting booth because that's what I did. Ooh, nice I transition. voted in Brooklyn for Mr. Jabari Brizport. Yes. I don't mind self-snitching, letting no. you all in. On what happens to me when I'm in the ballot box yeah. booth, yeah, pulling levers, pulling levers left and right. Hopefully, just left. Actually, that's me. How you like that? Yeah, I'm about the the self righteousness of right. getting the selfie totally. at the voting booth so that people know. Like if we were in one of those countries, a war torn country where the United States has to come in to prop up democracy, mm-hmm. like I, I need to have some ink on my thumb. So that people know that I that I'm I'm dreaming for about progress. Got it. So you is know? this like an insurance policy in case we lose? In case I, like Russia comes to rescue us or something? I want to be on the right side of history all right. the time, and right. the right side of history is always voting. Gabe, did you have a concussion? <laughs> this is I've... so not the Gabe Pacheco I've come to know and love. Yeah, no, this is just me wanting to be to be able to well actually anybody uh, oh, got it. who okay. comes at me. Nice. Okay. Uh, now, now with, this with makes any sense. with any like indignation or self righteousness, I could be like, uh, check it out, homie. I right. voted. What did so, you do? Because ninety percent of the time they won't be able to come back with even the simple that simple baseline level of participation in the democratic system. Got it. Do you know what you reminded me of, though, at first, before you told me about your ulterior motive? <laughs> yeah. Do you watch Curb Enthusiasm? I have seen it. I haven't watched the new season yet. Me neither, but I'm, actually. I'm, I'm, you know, waiting. Chomping at the bit. Chomping. Are you a big, like, Curb guy, or? I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty, pretty decent. big Curb guy. Decent, decent. size. I'm decent. Decent size Curb guy. It reminds me of when Larry David thinks he, spoiler alert, guys, if you don't watch Curb, but this is a couple of seasons ago, uh, the episode where he thinks he's not Jewish for a second. And he goes to visit his family who he thinks are his biological parents and not Jewish. On the way over on the plane, he's sitting in the emergency section by accident. They give this the spiel, the safety spiel at the beginning. And they're like, if you're uncomfortable doing X, Y, Z in case of emergency, then don't sit there. And he's like, hi, hi. Um, listen, I can't really sit here by the emergency door exit. I think you better get someone else. Okay, so we're about three minutes away from Wheels Up, so you okay. need to just stay put, okay? Because no, 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 we've got a full no, plane. No, you don't understand. I can't be sitting here. If something happens, I can't. We won't be able to get out. Calm down, okay? I cannot do it. I will panic. We will go down. All we need to know is that you're willing to assist passengers in the event of a non-traditional landing. I cannot be of any help whatsoever in any kind of non-traditional landing or any traditional landing. And he's like, yeah, I'm not comfortable, and asks for it to change his seat. Did you read the brochure? Read the brochure? I can't read that brochure. It's Chinese okay, to me. I'm, a... I'm sorry. Are you Chinese? Oh, you look a little Asian. I'm sorry. But it's just an expression. But I don't think you are Chinese. You look maybe Thai. I'm not sure. Okay, is it the seat or are you just scared to fly? No, I choke under pressure in any kind of game, basketball. If I was on the foul line and towards like the last five minutes of the game, I would miss the entire rim. Okay, I don't I see... couldn't even hit the rim because I was choking. Choking. Sir, how about I get you a drink? Would you like a Merlot? No, thank you. I don't drink. I don't drink. Just please find somebody else to sit here. I'll look for a seat for you, but you owe me one, mister. Thank you. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't want to sit here. Why should you give me a hard time? Just find somebody else. Who the hell knows how to do this thing? What, pull down? What is that going to do? Can I pull down? You have to be strong? I don't even know. Then what do you do? You smash this thing? What happens then? The door just suddenly opens miraculously? You're not Chinese. You don't look Chinese. What are you, Thai? I think you're Thai. You're Thai. I know it. 
because he leaves L.A. thinking he's Jewish. Then he meets his pseudo-biological parents. How do you spell your last name? C-O-N-E. They're not Jewish, so now he thinks he's not Jewish. Oh, my God. I'm Gentile. He does a funny montage of, like, changing the, the thing underneath the car, like, you know, chugging alcohol. All these allegedly non-Jewish things. And then he goes back on the plane. He's fine sitting in the emergency seat. He wears, like, a sweater vest. Anyway... He's like a confident and virile Gentile. Exactly. He's a, a confident, virile Gentile and also like not, um, he's not gauche, right? Like he sits in the emergency seat and, and fulfills his obligations and like he hugs Cheryl, his wife, when he comes home, like gives her a long hug. Um, <laughs> so that kind of reminds me of, you just reminded me of him there. Hey, so, thanks. I appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. Um, how, how is life? We haven't, I haven't seen you in a while, Gabe. I've missed it, you. It, it has been a while. Let's see. I went to DC and I had a really great experience there. I did some stand up uh, at a Puerto Rico fundraiser at Habana Village. And I spent some time with uh, Haywood Turnipseed, very funny stand up in DC, who just got a write up in the Washington Post. Mm. And uh, Teresa Concepcion and uh, Becca Lundberg were putting on this event. So. They did a great job raising some money for Puerto Rico at Habana Village. You know, I like that because that's some, like, like Latino hermandad, brotherhood, sisterhood. You got the Havana stuff. You got the Puerto Rico stuff. It's like a Caribbean cocktail. Yes. But not of the drinkable kind. No. No. But uh, hopefully, you know, cleaner water than what they have in Puerto Rico right now. Yes. Uh, almost a month after the hurricane, I guess, and still uh, a lot of the country is without power and clean drinking water. People are performing operations uh, using their iPhone lights. Wow. Yeah. That is a uniquely American story. I believe that's what George Bush said um, about once there was a woman complaining about having to work like a thousand jobs. And he's like, that's a, what a uniquely American story. Yeah. Because I work three jobs and I feel like I contribute you work three jobs. Three jobs, yes. Uniquely American, isn't it? I mean, that is fantastic that you're yes. doing that. And now, we are so excited to be talking to Norman Solomon, who is a journalist and also the founder of RootsAction.org, and most recently, Norman is one of the authors of a really crucial, important, exciting report called The Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis, and you can find that at democraticautopsy.org. Again, that's democraticautopsy.org. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Katie. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for coming. I wanted to know, first of all, just to, to provide some background, I wanted to know if you could explain what Roots Action is. Yes, um, it's a, uh, so to speak, direct action online group that I co-founded with Jeff Cohen about seven years ago. We started out with zero people. We ended up at this point with 1.3 million in the United States who are active uh, with Roots Action. And the basic concept was that while there have been a lot of and are some really great informational and analytical websites, and they've really just grown and uh, been very profuse and so important. We didn't really feel that there was a uh, a parallel arsenal of uh, online action groups uh, that could do petitions, that could do mass emails to corporate and government officials who could organize effectively explicitly for the purposes of political and social action. To be blunt, the existing groups like Move On, we just felt were too tied to the Democratic Party taking leadership from those on Capitol Hill in the party. And uh, also we noticed a real deficit. And keep in mind that was uh, seven years ago. In terms of the major online action groups that were willing to take on corporate power, willing to challenge the top of the Democratic Party, and willing to challenge war during the Obama era. I think since then, just to digress slightly, there's been an improvement from a lot of groups willing to take on the corporatization of a lot of policy. Uh, We're still sort of out on our own in terms of large groups to 
have an anti-war focus as well and to support whistleblowers uh, such as Edward Snowden and Thomas Drake and uh, Jeffrey Sterling and so forth. This is an autopsy that you've written. So can you do a, what, what would this be, a sonogram of the, uh, of the birth of this project? Yes, we have a, a logo of a donkey flat on its back. And uh, I don't know if the Democratic National Committee will come after us, but we think it's fair use. It's just their emblem um, just upside down uh, in right. terms of its condition. Uh, but uh, basically the sonogram or the uh, see-through would be uh, – made necessary, was made necessary by the fact that contrary to tradition after a losing presidential race, uh, the Democratic Party, the Democratic National Committee, it became clear, just wasn't going to do an autopsy. And um, so the realization sunk in by the end of the spring this year that if there was going to be an autopsy done, especially if there's going to be a no holds barred, um, no BS autopsy, that it was going to have to be done independently, and um, so we decided to do it ourselves through the initiative of RootsAction.org and uh, our umbrella group, Action for a Progressive Future. We uh, set up a task force, and one thing led to another. We got a lot of help from folks who were not listed, but the autopsy was basically four people, myself, and the other coordinator um, is Karen Bernal, who is a longtime activist inside and outside the Democratic Party who is in her third two-year term as the chair of the Progressive Caucus of the California Democratic Party. And just in terms of perspective, I think it's useful to mention that, of course, the California Party is the largest uh, Democratic state party, and the Progressive Caucus, by some measures, is the largest caucus in the party, has about a third of the entire uh, Democratic State Central Committee in it. And also Pia Gallegos, who is a civil rights attorney based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Sam McCann, who's based in New York, a researcher and a longtime um, activist as well at an international NGO these days. And so the purpose was to cohesively focus on ways in which the Democratic Party had uh, fallen down on the job last year, particularly in attention to what could be changed and done for the better in the future. And what was the most um, surprising discovery for you? To me, it was the sum of the parts, kind of like having seen a jumble of puzzle pieces on the table, but then as we put them together, it's the blend of incompetence, trust in doing things the way that they've been done before, um, Dishonesty, which wasn't startling, but still right. sometimes breathtaking, from the Clinton campaign last year and the way that the DNC has uh, continued to function. And if there was one thing that was the most startling is that almost no lessons of any consequence have been apparently learned by the debacle, the tragedy of essentially allowing Donald Trump to become president. And here we are, you know, we're in... Uh, a year later after the election, and you can sum up all the ways in which funds have been appropriated, messaging has been done, policies have been pursued by the top of the Democratic Party, and it's almost like there's nobody home. I mean, the, the race in Georgia that raised a record amount of money, uh, it was like up, upwards of $20 million spent for the Democratic Party candidate, us off a losing race, just money dumped in to go after persuadable voters who weren't persuadable. And that's really emblematic of what was the case a year ago in Clinton's loss. And as we speak, what was the case as recently as the Virginia race, um, where the Democratic Party just dumped a ton of money into trying to find Romney voters who would vote for the Democratic candidate for governor. And this is sort of the quest for the Holy Grail that doesn't exist in any meaningful quantity. So I, I'd say just sort of to sum up, Katie, in terms of uh, answering your, your question here, that was startling to me because you'd think just on the face of it that the demographics who are the base of the party where the vote could be turned out with sufficient attention, resources, messaging, quantity and quality, working class people, young people and people of color, you'd think that those smart guys and gals uh, tell us they're the smartest political folks in the room, 
that they would go after those voters. And yet, it wasn't just last year, it's as recently as the Virginia race, they just didn't do it. Right. Um, you are talking about the kind of holy grail voters. Uh, you, you're, The autopsy mentions this kind of scary and perfect uh, Chuck Schumer quote which is from July 2016, where he said, quote, for every blue collar Democrat we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we will pick up two moderate Republicans in the suburbs in Philadelphia. And you can repeat that in Ohio and Illinois and Wisconsin, end quote. Um, Now, that is, I think, for a lot of people, that kind of boils down the problem with the Democrats. Um, Do you think that Chuck Schumer, even on kind of an optics level, has learned anything from that? Do you think the election dispelled that idea at all for him and you know not i'm i'm asking about chuck schumer but i guess democrats in general do you think they they know even not to even just say stuff like that anymore well they know not to maybe say it so overtly i think at the most uh, high levels the schumers the pelosi's and the tom perez's they know they need to choose their words a bit uh, more carefully and less arrogantly but at the same time, there's not little evidence. There's not much evidence. There's very little evidence that the behavior and the underlying assumptions have changed. And so, one of the things that comes to mind is a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times Magazine had a big story uh, purporting to analyze the uh, situation that the Democratic Party is in. And you know, most of it was just sort of routine stuff, which you know one would expect from the New York Times. Not very illuminating, but it starts out by recounting that the morning after, the horrific morning after Trump uh, won the election, there was a a phone call convened uh, with Nancy Pelosi and uh, Democrats in the House. And uh, by several accounts of Congress people on it, uh, she was pretty blasé, you Mm -hmm. know, that there was a a lack of any introspection of any substance or self-reflection and just you know, we didn't message quite right. And I think that's really the overarching, oh, we need to do a better idea of communicating that we're really on the side of working people. Well, the problem is, at the very top of the party, there's not all that much evidence they are on the side of working people. And there is a lot of evidence that they want to sort of serve two masters, one rhetorically, working class, and substantively not take on the Wall Street, uh, big bank sort of... uh, uh, 800 pound uh, gorilla or whatever on the windpipe of democracy in this country. We're choking off of it. I think it's uh, worth uh, noting that if we were going to have a party that truly represented working people, uh, then it would be willing to echo what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said in 1936 in a speech at Madison Square Garden. He said, the wealthy, the overprivileged, They hate me, and I welcome their hatred. Uh, But de facto, what has been said was said by President Obama for eight years, and and some, uh, a lot of top Democrats, even when they do posture and sometimes to some degree do challenge Wall Street, they say, in effect, that Wall Street may not like us, but we want them to like us. And that's a fundamentally different approach. As we say in the autopsy, if you go at this, uh, you end up in a situation and you analyze what is actually uh, being propounded as the political line from the top of the Democratic Party, uh, they want to make nice with everybody. And they want to say Wall Street and Main Street don't have a fundamental contradiction. And they essentially have victims without victimizers. So there's this oozing of empathy you know, to whatever degree, sincere or not, with working people. I mean, we saw it, you know, when I was a Bernie delegate on the floor and people saw, uh, millions of people saw on television, the uh, procession of speakers and some of them quite eloquent at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, July last year, and, you know, eloquent commiseration and support for uh, victims, victims of the system and uh, without victimizers. Mm. And as we say in the autopsy report, that really isn't credible and it isn't passionate. It is not the way the real world functions. If you've got victims of the economic order, this corporate capitalist system and overdrive, gee, there must be some victimizers and 
big part of the problem is that huge amounts of money from the donor class of those victimizers keeps pouring into the coffers of the Democratic Party. Also, I think that the danger in not acknowledging the victimizers who are who are actually causing, you know, suffering, if we don't identify them and we don't explain that it's income inequality or that it's corporations, what you have is, as you, you refer to this in the autopsy, but you have a vacuum that's filled by someone like Donald Trump, right, who does give people a bad guy to rally or, or against, but that bad guy is um, Mexicans, Muslims. So there's this weird kind of uh, attempt to – there's this weird false equivalency that I think has, has um, surfaced, this narrative of false equivalency that equates Trump and Bernie because they're both kind of tap into people's anger um, as if telling people to direct their anger towards income inequality and telling them to direct their anger towards disenfranchised, m marginalized groups of people are somehow – the same or at all similar. Yes, that's been so thematic and was from the beginning when Bernie got momentum in late 2015 in his campaign. So much mass media was just pounding that drum because if you're not on their bus, you're off their bus and anybody off their bus uh, should be conflated. Uh, it's as though, uh, as you're alluding to, Katie, if you blame Mexicans and you blame Wall Street, that's the same thing. Right. It's, it's as though in some cases the uh, implication or communication from the mass media is if you uh, say Mexicans are uh, rapists when they come over the border, that's the same as saying that income inequality is inappropriate because Wall Street is making out like bandits. And it's this because the system, I think, whether it's the New York Times uh, or the Washington Post, etc., or the top of the Democratic Party, because they're so wedded to the status quo, ultimately, and the corporate order, uh, they bemoan income inequality, but they don't want to do much about it because it might cut up the pie uh, differently and they'd get a s smaller wedges. This is um, a way in which populism has to be all be put in one basket, and they won't differentiate appreciably so often between uh, racist, uh, xenophobic uh, types of, I would say, pseudo-populism, and the real thing, which is uh, progressive populism, which has uh, been responsible in large measure for one way or another, most that we can be proud of in our country. Right. It's it's really, I mean, it's shocking. And I'm not sure if people actually believe it, uh, if they're being cynical or if they're actually, if they believe it. Because the idea that you can kind of respond to right-wing pseudo-populism with a kind of moderate um, politics it's just so obviously, I mean, just just on its face in terms of logic is so clearly not not going to work. Yes. And I think one other strand of what you said that I, I didn't respond to yet, which is uh, that it opens the door wide for the demagoguery right. of the right wing racist, uh, et cetera, uh, tendencies that uh, Trump has inflamed, exploited, you know, way back uh when I was writing a column with Jeff Cohen and uh, when FAIR was examining what was going on, at the time when uh, Patrick Buchanan was in his heyday, he was going into New Hampshire, he was winning some primaries, and uh, as my memory serves, this would have been um, 1992. And uh, Pat Buchanan was really a forerunner of Donald Trump. He just didn't do so good on TV as Trump uh, did and so forth is sort of like Jersey Kaczynski's film being there or book that began a film being there. And so um, uh, Patrick Buchanan looked a little bit too much like Nixon, you know, a little bit surly looking, etc. But he definitely had his base. And at a certain point, he said explicitly with reference to the uh, so-called former uh, Klansman, uh, David Duke, he said um, uh, that the Republican Party needed to pick up the discards from uh, David Duke. David Duke obviously wasn't that marketable in the, in the national media, but the Republican Party should pick it up. And actually, that's you know, what has happened. So that sort of populism, when the Democratic Party slams the door shut on progressive populism and people are enraged and angry, then uh, the other avenue seems to be uh, this, this racist, xenophobic avenue that the Republicans have opened up 
uh, with such a, such, a, such a vengeance. And uh, it's so striking to me that even now, the Democratic Party leadership, with some exception, really doesn't uh, get it or want to get it. And, you know, when you say, well, how, how genuine or sincere it is, I, I'm sure it's a spectrum that some just literally don't get it. And some, there's this classic quote from Bernie Sanders about six months ago when he said that uh, some in the Democratic Party don't mind being on the Titanic as long as they have a first-class cabin. And I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, let's face it, Hillary Clinton is not dumb. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Bill Clinton are not dumb. They're cognitively able to analyze some things, but they like, uh, they like hobnobbing. They like hanging out with the millionaires and the billionaires. And I think it's uh, quite uh, illustrative. You know, I'm, I'm not a big sports analyst, but I think if somebody is swinging at a baseball or uh, swinging at a golf ball, what happens after they made contact with the ball is sort of a tip-off to what their swing is, you know. And I see Barack Obama's activities since he's been president as emblematic. He goes in for six-figure speeches from Wall Street. He made a beeline uh, to hang out with a billionaire or two right after he was no longer president. And uh, you can analyze the people he appointed to his cabinet and so forth, including his patron, Penny Pritzker, a couple billionaire asset person who sponsored him, sort of like Pamela Harriman, Pamela, Pamela Harriman, who befriended Bill Clinton and got him into the swing to be president in 1992. And it, it tells us a lot about the priorities. And that's where Bernie, again, I think, hit it just right. This is about elitism. This is about identification. And in an interview the other day that... Um, the co-coordinator of this task force for the autopsy uh, did on the NPR program On Point, Karen Bernal uh, said a couple times, just clearly and simply and directly, it's about class consciousness. Who do you identify with? Who do you care about? Whose needs are you willing to champion? Yeah, it really is. It just seems like a law of physics. I mean, I was talking to, I had uh, Shuja Hader was on my show, who wrote a great piece uh uh, he, he does a lot of writing, but he wrote a great piece for Jacobin about choosing sides after Charlottesville. But he and I were talking about the equating of Trump and Sanders and how inappropriate it is because, OK, yeah, they both, let's say, speak to people who feel angry at the system. But saying that they're the same is kind of like saying that a gang leader and, an, and a mentor, a big brother's mentor or something are the same people because they both mm. speak to, uh, you know, uh, Disaf potentially disaffected young people, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of shocking sometimes. It can be shocking. The extent to which these memes are picked up and used by people in power, you know, in the throes of a campaign and also later, for instance, there's the, I think, should be notorious instance where Hillary Clinton was so eager to get black votes that her ally, John Lewis, said that, he went to civil rights demonstrations and he never saw Bernie there. You know, the, the aspersion being that somehow Bernie w was not a genuine um, civil rights advocate, whereas Bernie uh, did many de was at many demonstrations for civil rights when he was uh, in his early 20s at the University of Chicago. And one could note that at that time, approximately, Hillary Clinton was at the 1964 Republican convention as an avowed, quote, Goldwater girl, unquote. But pulling that out, you know, it's like whatever weapon is useful, uh, just throw it out. And even very recently, as a matter of fact, there was that uh, terrific video that you did of Hillary Clinton. And, and what's the name of the video or how can people Oh, it's, it? I think it's called Hillary Clinton's Revisionism. I, I'll look it up because I should probably know. Yeah. It. And and uh, when I saw it, I was stunned. I had not uh, watched on TV the clip that you included in that video of Hillary Clinton talking about her book just very recently. And she makes this very nasty comment about how Bernie Sanders, he's not even a Democrat. Oh, my God. Yeah. I am proud to be a Democrat. I've been a Democrat for decades. I have supported Democrats. I've worked for Democrats. Bernie's not a Democrat, and, and that's not a slam. 
that's what he says himself. And, why, and get out of the way. Why are you mucking around with our party? You're not even a Democrat. You don't want to support Democrats. Then go somewhere else. I mean, and it just, to me, it epitomizes the freeze frame mentality that's like 30 or 40 years behind the times. As we point out in the autopsy, there are way more independents in this country than registered Democrats. There's about 30% of the people who are registered voters who are registered Democrats. There's 40% that are independents, or as in California and some states, we call them decline to state. So here she's publicly casting aspersions on the legitimacy of somebody um, and, and two out of five voters are in that category. Right. So it's as though the Democratic Party is this club and we run the club. So stay out. And a metaphor and an example, a, a serious one, was, for instance, in New York State during the primary, as in some other states, independents either were not able to vote last year in the Democratic primary or they had to go through a, a torturous um, labyrinth uh, running a gauntlet that made it very, very difficult to vote in the primary. And that's a sort of exclusionary approach that, of course, is good for people who run the party now and want to keep running it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I always joke when people say that when say people say he's not even a Democrat. I'm like, why are you trying to make me like him? I'm already sold on him. You know, you don't have to do the <laughs> yeah. work. But it is a kind of shockingly myopic and out of touch thing to say. I'm never surprised about what some of these people think, but I am surprised when they say it out loud. But what's even weirder than that he's a Democrat is sorry, he's not a Democrat. He never was Democrat. What's even weirder is the why didn't he run as an independent or he should just run as an independent. Now, don't these people realize what that would have meant? I mean, okay, Hillary wound up losing to Donald Trump, but do they not get that that would have that that would have made him? I'm sure in their eyes a spoiler. I mean, that's precisely what he didn't do, right? I, I think he was afraid of, yes. of giving the Republicans an advantage by dividing. Absolutely, yeah. he has that. Bernie has that. What I would call political maturity and and self selflessness. Yeah. I mean, certainly compared. Okay, that's a. a I jump over a low standard right. to be more <laughs> right. selfless than Hillary Clinton. Damning but, him with faint praise. But still in all, you know, ever since 1984, the year when Mondale ran for president, when push came to shove and it was up against either, in that case, Reagan or Mondale, uh, Bernie supported uh, Mondale over Reagan. And uh, it's hard to see any other course that would have uh, made sense from a simple moral uh, standpoint. And there's the critique from both directions, as you say, it's nonsensical from the mainstream. Oh, we'll just be an independent or be some third party. Right. And then there are some on the left who, and I heard this when I was a delegate uh, at the convention the last year, oh, Bernie should have bolted the party and uh, run as a Green or something independent. And part of it was people in the Green Party who welcomed or wanted Bernie in their fantasy to run as a Green Party candidate. But then, of course, when he didn't, then they trashed him as, you know, politically inadequate anyway. So sort of a, a hypocritical posture. But sure. I think underneath it all, I, there's a precept of a, uh, a Chinese sage from centuries ago. And I think it's quite apt. It says, when you're in a struggle with an adversary, don't do what you most want to do. Do what your adversary least wants you to do. And I think our adversaries, if you define it as corporate America and the right wing and so forth, what they most want uh, us to do as activists for you know, Bernie, for instance, they would love to have Bernie siphon off a few percent uh, on a different uh, line on the ballot. And what they most don't want us to do, and I think we must do, and the autopsy is about this, is have a progressive groundswell and upsurge and on a principled basis, take over the Democratic Party. Right. Yeah. Well, it's such an irony. But the, the people who are most kind of love wearing their Democratic Party label on their sleeves the most are the ones who are putting it at risk the most. It is this tribalism and this sense of identity that it's so emotional that, yes. again, they just can't see what's even on, in their own best self-interest. So going back to the question of... Um, of messaging because you brought up something really important which is that for Pelosi and I've heard a lot of other Democrats say this they say that the issue wasn't so much the policies the politics or you know the positions or the record it's really about messaging and that of course is a scary takeaway but you say in in um in 
autopsy. By co-opting the language and oftentimes the policies of the Republicans, it became increasingly hard for Democrats to distinguish themselves from the GOP. And if there's a general sense that the differences are not significant, it makes voting seem that much less urgent. The overriding issue is not about the reality of the differences. It's about the perception of them. In a 2013 survey, 60% of, Af of Americans said it doesn't matter which party controls Congress, a poisonous image problem that can best be countered with a clear progressive reboot of the Democratic Party. And then you say um, earlier on, there's a quote, um, where is that, about marketing? You say, it says... Um, you're talking about the outreach and the um, massive swing of white working class voters from Obama to, sorry, you're talking about the uh, turnout among African Americans and Latinos being lower than expected. Um, yes. And you say to put- and, and I would add, you know, 5% uh, lower turnout or rather votes, according to exit polls, 5% lower voting for Hillary Clinton last year than for Barack Obama in in 2012, you know, which is stunning given that Trump was the opponent. Right. Just what a flood. Right. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we should go back to that. And you say, to put it in marketing terms, the Democratic Party is failing on a systemic level to inspire, bring out, and get a sufficient majority of the votes of the working class. So those two things together made me think of um, a, another potential kind of danger for the Democrats, which is what if they do just turn get better at messaging, right? Like you, it says in, in autopsy, it's a question of perception more than reality. And I think that, you know, when Obama said he would win a third term, I think he's right. And I don't think it's because his policies or record um, were a lot better, more progressive or more friendly to the working class than Hillary's were or um, would have been, but because he's a much better salesman. I mean, he's a much better communicator. And interestingly enough, you even have Hillary Clinton saying that during one of the debates. She said, I'm not a natural politician like my husband mm -hmm. or the president. So yeah. w what if they are just better at messaging? and they do get out the vote and they inspire people to come out, then what happens? Well, if the package around the candy bars is containing a candy bar that people decide is rancid, the packaging will just go so far, the same for the advertising and the messaging and the jingle for the candy bar. Right. And I think it catches up to you. I mean, you can only do it for so long. Um, you think about Clinton with NAFTA, with uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, with his stocking of his cabinet with corporate folks. And um, after eight years, okay, it, again, it fits in with a sort of political narcissism. He did just fine, but uh, the, the uh, so-called contract with America, the contract uh, on America in 1994 that uh, the Republicans and Newt Gingrich wrote in on, that was in the midst of the uh, uh, NAFTA fight and so forth. And of course, the corporates like to blame things like, you know, gays in the military, not that Clinton was that strong on it. And so forth. they're always saying the right wing and the corporate Democrats, oh, you, you were too far left. That was the problem. No, it was falling away of union workers, non-union workers, seeing alliances with the um, corporate trade pacts that actually put Clinton in alliance with Republicans. That's the only way and he got it through Congress was an alliance of some Democrats and then Republicans pushing it through. And, you know, so to your point, I think that Obama, it was going to catch up with the Democratic Party and Obama sailed through. Yeah, he's a good spokesperson, but people were getting very angry. And that's what, you know, Occupy reflected, but it reflected people who would never be caught dead at a demonstration. They're just angry. And, uh, We've seen, you know, income inequality and the the, the sense of economic uh, fear, desperation. So unless, I mean, does anybody really listen to Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and feel that they deeply understand what it's like to not know how you're going to put your kids right. through college or pay the mortgage? I, it's just not credible. Right. I mean, Nina Turner, I remember watching her on MSNBC saying, and obviously this is a woman who is not a fan of Trump's, um, but she's honest about it. And uh, this is kind of a theme, the theme of autopsy, too, which is like not being afraid of saying things that people need to hear. And she said, yes. you know, Trump is good at making it seem like he feels people's pain. Like he doesn't, but he, he sells it. And, um, and there is, you know, there's an authenticity to him. It's not really an authenticity, but he and, and Sanders both have something like that you talk about in the in autopsy that seems like it's it's outside of the establishment. 
which is again well it's like that saying in the case of trump you know sincerity is easy if you can fake it effectively right um and so you know trump is good at it he knows cameras he knows right. microphones and right. all, all of that i think of course as you as we're saying too, bernie um exudes sincerity and authenticity but i guess it's possible not to get too philosophical to be an authentic phony mm -hmm. or to be really good i mean i think Re reagan was that mm. and he just knew the cameras right. knew what that's like and you know some people are more adept the camera likes them or they like the camera you know some sort of mutual attraction and so we you know we still keep coming back to the need for substance and policy and especially because of the uh, corporate globalization that's taken place and capital flight and the internationalization of the financial services industry and the the, uh, the race to the bottom and factories leaving so from a global perspective unless there's a real change then these these jobs are not coming back and the mantra which obama loved and the democratic party leadership still loves is oh we just have to edge we got to do more job training but right. the jobs are not there or they're flipping hamburgers and it's only because some local it's only due to the fact that bernie and a movement and fight for 15 has raised hell that what seemed impossible a couple of years ago has been coming to fruition that many localities are passing a 15 dollar an hour minimum wage which hopefully is just a start right one of, I think, the most frustrating things for anyone who is critical of the Dems is this idea that, uh, and, and this is why the autopsy metaphor is so good, and also the, the train wreck metaphor, but this idea that, you know, we need to defeat Trump, and uh, that means that we can't squabble over what happened. We can't look back. We have to look forward. And we have to blame Russia, and we have to blame misogyny. And you guys write in autopsy, and this is so. This should be such a no-brainer, but it's not apparently. You you write rather than addressing topics beyond the control of the Democratic Party, whether FBI Director Comey, Russia misogyny of some voters, etc. This autopsy focuses on some key factors that have been significantly under the party's control. This report focuses on some of our party's most crucial flaws, fissures, and opportunities. If this really were about defeating Trump, like we would, the Dems would want to look at what happened, right? And and they are so focused on the things that even if they played a role, even if Russia did play a significant role, even if James Comey did play a significant role, like you guys say in, in the autopsy, that's not something Dems can, can control. So why is there so much resistance to looking at the things that the Democrats actually not only did, but could do? And what are those, what are the takeaways they should be getting? Well, I think some of what has gradually dawned on Bernie Sanders supporters in the last year and not dawned on nearly enough of them enough is that the charge of Russia interference was a godsend for the Clinton wing of the party. The book shattered by mm -hmm. two journalists who, was, who were embedded in the Clinton campaign. Uh, the book that came out a few months ago that they produced, towards the back of the book, and I wrote a piece about this, but it's got very little attention. It describes that 24 hours after Clinton's defeat at the Brooklyn National Headquarters of the Clinton campaign, John Podesta and Robbie Mook and other top people from the campaign got a bunch of pizza, uh, the boxes strewn over the floor, and they met in utter dejection, of course, and they decided to blame Russia for the defeat. Mm. And when you think about it, the natural question after the defeat is, how did this possibly happen? And the logical signposts would have had arrows directly to Clinton and her wing of the party are too close to Wall Street. All that about her speeches, her six-figure fees that Bernie hammered her on in the primary and that were totally legitimate and important issues. If that inquiry, that line of inquiry, as the lawyers say, had been pursued in December, January, February, it, it would have uh, locked in a narrative of inquiry that could have really changed the party uh, pretty quickly. And it might have uh, meant that the Clinton wing could not have held on to the Democratic National Committee. So the whole uh, Russia, Russia, Russia meme that so many people, I think, uh, unwittingly embraced has been a focus on uh, whatever its merits of um, the intervention did it mean much? I, I don't think it really had much impact on the election results. But 
It's as though, to go back to the train metaphor, um, investigators came back in and really ignored everything that the railroad and the engineer and the entire train company did uh, before the train wreck and when it all went off the rails with horrible, tragic results, and instead talked about the weather, you know? Uh, and so I really think that ultimately we're going to have to get back to the issues of class and the issues of whose side are you on? They're much more interested, and it makes sense in a way, but they're much more interested in covering their, their behinds than they are in getting to what happened. I mean, they're acting much more like, if we're talking about autopsy, like they're acting more like coroners who, who killed the patient and are trying to cover it up than coroners who are actually trying to figure out what happened. Right, that some of the records are just uh, disappeared. Yeah, exactly, right. And I think we're in a dilemma. We're really in a dilemma now, but I think it's clear the path has to be, and the autopsy is part of this, direct principle confrontation with the power structure, with the Pelosi and Schumer leadership in Congress, with Tom Perez running the Democratic National Committee, because the abject failure, not only in 2016, but during the last year in terms of special congressional elections and so forth, uh, that is a consequence of the continuation of the very policies that lost Clinton the election in the first place. And that means sooner rather than later, coming to grips with the real character of leadership of the party. The progressives are ready, willing, and able to step into the breach. You do have Elizabeth Warren speaking clearly. You have Keith Ellison. You have Bernie. You have a lot of people who are ready, willing, and able to turn this into a progressive party, but it's going to be a big battle. You know, one of the things that people keep hiding behind uh, is that, and, and I think people keep, it's really disgusting, they keep trying to, to silence people or delegitimize people or smear people with, like, it's, it's McCarthyist, really, or it's neo-McCarthyist. Of course, Russia's not communist, but they're using the same tactics that they did in many ways, and it's, it's like red baiting without the, the communism, but... Right. Um, one of the things they do is they try to say, you know, you're you're just using Russia talking points the same way they say you're using conservative talking points, um, right wing talking points. And of course, if that's true, that whole guilt by association thing, then we can all call Hillary Clinton a, a Henry Kissinger ally. Right. Um, right. If just let's just be consistent. One of the other things that people use, I think, to stop, try to silence people or stifle them is the accusation that, you know, if you don't support Clinton, you don't support black women. And as you guys point out in this report, the Democratic Party has experienced an 11% drop in support from black women, uh, according to one survey. And the percentage of black women who said that neither party represents them went from 13% in 2016 to 21% in 2017. So um, what do you have to say about the, the, those changes? Yes, of any demographic that you could define, African-American women are the most consistent high supporters of Democratic candidates. And um, Essence Magazine uh, co-sponsored the survey that you mm. mentioned. And those are stunning drops from a year ago to now. It really speaks to the fact that having a base and treating them like just uh, uh, routine, you can count on them, don't pay much attention to them. And, you know, I think of that Stevie Ooh. Wonder song from long I ago, you just... Yeah come see us at election time. It doesn't work well in the long run. And it, the phrase eroding the base really comes to mind that that has been happening. And when you compare that or, or augment that with just the huge vote uh, for young people, uh, for from young people, for Bernie, that developed uh, very quickly among young people generally and increasingly among African-American and Latino young people during the primaries. And then a lot of the same people just sat out the general election. And I did a piece for the Hill newspaper uh, very early in the fall last year. And looking at the latest polling data, I said that at that point, if the election were held right then, that Gary Johnson would get more votes of the under 30 voters than Hillary Clinton. Mm. And you would think that, that that sort of data would have set off alarm bells uh, from the Clinton general election campaign. And you would, you would have thought that the lack of uh, evidence support 
that should have been there, say from Latinos, for instance, would have set off alarm bells. But no, they just sort of blithely went on sinking money into trying to get Republican suburban voters who went for Romney to go for Clinton. Yeah, it's this fire, the firewall, right? They don't have to yeah. right. work, uh, uh, you know, they can totally take for granted. And it does get back to what I'm sure people, Katie, are listening, some would think, well, gee, but these were smart people. So why would they possibly shoot themselves in right. the foot that way? And I think part of it is the mentality that this is how they see the world. They assume other people could see the world this way. And also, uh, frankly, I just think that they would much rather have more so-called centrist and moderate Republicans in the Democratic Party than a lot of riffraff who have class consciousness who might overturn the apple cart of the wealthy of which the people running the party are generally part of. Right. There's an attempt to kind of hide ideology under a fake concern with pragmatism. And it's and, right. you know, we I had uh, Adam Gaffney, who's a great single payer advocate and doctor. He said something on my show. He said when people say something can't happen because they don't want it to happen. Well, we're getting the short end of both ends of the stick on this, because not only does the ideology suck and it's moving by what's articulated and not articulated, the country's frame of reference further to the right. But the Democrats also are losing elections as a consequence to the far right. Right. Exactly. And yeah. So it's it, it cuts against. I mean, this is sort of like uh, the trashing of Bernie because he's not a registered uh, Democrat, you know, pretending that we're 50 years ago right. when there wasn't this huge demographic that's uh, registered as independents. It's also just uh, failing to see uh, that there's been this shift in terms of people's uh, interest and belief systems that it's a very uh, uh, it's fertile ground if we're only willing and really want to plant and harvest in it. And instead of being excited about that, people uh, pretend that it's just not achievable. Yes, it, it, indeed. I mean, I, I always love to uh, quote Jim Hightower, uh, who uh, says, uh, people who say it can't be done should get out of the way of those who are doing it. And uh, granted, it's an uphill battle. And yet, what isn't that's worthwhile? And, you know, the aspirational becomes reality. I mean, yeah, one of the worst right. things is hearing people say, how, you know, how, how can Bernie, uh, you know, put, push Medicare for all? So how can he push single payer? It has no chance of passing. It's so selfish. It's so self-indulgent. It's, you know, uh, what is it, white male privilege. Like, do you, do you realize what you would have sounded like talking about anything? Like, first of all, about same-sex marriage a couple of years ago, um, right. voting rights, uh, Social Security, all these things. And you can't, that, even if something's not going to, come to fruition immediately you have to do the work first right and that's what happens you 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 popular popularize an idea become part of the mainstream and then it becomes a political liability to stand in its way i just i don't get sorry i this is like they're a therapy session i just never understand if people actually think this or they're just being cynical um well i'm sure there's a spectrum right. there and ironically the right wing has not been so encumbered with this sort of uh, glitch in thinking they have imagined, uh, beginning with their so-called Reagan revolution, should be called the Reagan counter-revolution, right. they have imagined this, the savage decimation of safety nets, right. of the environment, They and they went out to accomplish it, and it seemed very unrealistic, but they've been doing it. Right. And then what you have, you have, you know, centrist libs saying to, to if, you, if you dare to use that example, or if you use the example of the Tea Party, right, like pulling the party to the right, then, oh, well, what are you, a white supremacist Tea Partier? You know, like, it's just so, it's so disingenuous or stupid. That's, that's the theme of uh, 2016, uh, ignorant or, or dishonest. Well, thank you so much, uh, Norman Solomon. Thanks, Katie. And we have been talking with him about the report that he co-authored, Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis, and you can find that at democraticautopsy.org. Again, that's democraticautopsy.org. To hear the rest of our interview with Norman Solomon, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. That was a great interview. Oh, but now I learned so much. I learned so much, right? I'm I'm yes. I'm schwitzing. I'm quelling. I don't know. My what to third say. eye dilated. Totally. I can't even it's so it's taking up my entire bo I'm nothing but a third eye. That's all I am. Rolling yeah. rolling down the streets of New York City. 
I'm that galactic brain meme right now. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm kind of that every day, but I'm especially that today. Tonight, post talking to Norm Solomon. Make sure you rate and review us on iTunes. Please like our Facebook page. What else can people do? Oh my God. People can just, just give us money. Venmo us. Yes. Venmo us. Call. Yeah. Why not? Venmo us. I mean, you may need our. It's Gabriel hyphen <laughs> Checo. I'm going to bleep that out. I don't want you to get uh, <laughs> uh, harassed. Although I guess you won't get harassed. Well, um, yeah, it, it's. I think it'll be fine. What are people going to do? Just send some uh, some smiley faces yeah, at me? Yeah, I know. What's the worst they could do? Show up outside your apartment? You can find Gabe on Twitter at Gabe underscore Pacheco. You can find me on Twitter at KT Helps. That's letter K, letter T, H-A-L-P-S. And you can use the hashtag KT Helps Show. That's letter K, letter T, H-A-L-P-S, H-O-W. The KT Helper Show is produced by Florence Burrow Adams with help from Joshua Bregman. Our theme song is by The Ballet. We will see you next week. Bye.